Well, thanks, Tom, Jim, and the board. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm ruining your lunch. Uh, I apologize for that. But I, I do really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you a little bit uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm going on six and a half years, believe it or not, as administrator at WAPA on the, the best job that I've ever had. And I say that uh, from the bottom of my heart. And it's because of the relationship that we have with our customers. Um, and the fact that I'm learning something every single day. Like I got an invite last night for ice fishing, which is my old passion, so I, I appreciate the, the invitation for that. I also had an experience uh, this past summer that um, very few people get to do. I, I was on a tribal stakeholders trip down the Colorado River for nine days. And I call it the uh, heaven and hell tour. <laughs> um, and, and I say that because uh, it was heaven going down the river with six Native American tribes, with uh, three or four of our customers, people from the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, the Grand Canyon Trust. It was 24 of us on two 38-foot rafts going down the river. Uh, it was hell because it was 105 degrees every day, and it cooled off to 95 at night. And privately, if you want to ask how you use the bathroom facilities, I'll let you know that as well. Uh, but what I really learned on that trip was a couple of interesting things about the valuable role that WAPA and its customers have in the interactions. For our tribal customers, the importance of the river and what that meant to their culture. For the biologists on our trip, the impact that we have on stream flows and what are known as bug flows were really, really important. And as we enter markets, which I'll talk about in a moment, the impact of operating the dams differently makes a difference on all of the native species that we have to deal with. And I also learned how to live without a shower for nine days, um, which I don't recommend. The, the, it was 105 degrees outside. The river is 47 degrees. Um, and so you're torn between, I'm either going to die of the heat or I'm going to freeze in the, the silty river. And I say this because the roles that WAPA plays and the role that all of our customers and our tribes and all of our stakeholders is really part of the story in the fact that we all live in what I, in a connected world. You heard some of it this morning. Bill showed that picture of, of Pick Sloan and what that means. And keep in mind, geographically, that is just a little over half of the square miles that we have to deal with and the politics that we have to deal with. And at WAPA, we keep working to make sure that we're agile, integrated, responsive, engaged, and resilient in this ever-connected world. I was I really enjoyed the comments about the work you're doing with the homes, Tom, and all these technologies. And while they sound far-fetched, I can tell you whether it's electric vehicles, home thermostats, or customers demanding renewable energy and storage, it is coming harder and faster than we could ever imagine. The world of the future certainly for a large grid operator like WAPA, is going to have to figure out how do we connect those thousands or millions of points of light. The edge of the grid technologies are going to continue to change our world. And so it's really important for us to understand what does that mean and how do we drive that into the way we run our organizations. Another thing I learned on the river trip, which was really interesting, about, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, WAPA really re-examined its core values that hadn't been looked at since the mid-90s, and we thought it was time. And I, I want to go through the six of them very briefly, and I'll tell you why that resonated so much. The first is to listen, to understand, and to speak with purpose, to seek, to share, to partner, to be curious, learn more, do better, repeat, respect self others and the environment, do what is right, do what is safe, and serve like your lights depend on it. And I will tell you, in talking with our tribal members in particular in the evenings around the, thank goodness they weren't camp fires, they were camp bulbs because it was so hot, um, when we talked about the core values, it really resonated with those folks. We had some real heart-to-heart -heart discussions, which included the fact that WAPA's footprint is very big and more than just the Colorado River or the Missouri River, the world that we live with and the world we live in is much, much bigger and broader. And we have to understand what those implications are. 
the fact of the matter for an organization like WAPA, one size does not fit all. What works well in California doesn't necessarily work well in South Dakota or Minnesota. We've learned that with our market decision going in the upper Great Plains, bringing that into SPP in October of 2015. That has been a very successful venture. But I will tell you the challenges in bring, doing that included folks thinking that we were crazy and folks insisting we do more analysis. And in fact, I can tell you from all the analysis that we did, we were 100% <laughs> wrong in the right direction. Right. So we did all this modeling. We, we really looked at this stuff, and it's turned out to be really tremendous. $48 million this year in additional revenue. Running the dams in a different profile. Right. We assumed we were going to be chasing wind here. And guess what? We're not. We're being dispatched on the flat curve. So those things are, are really um, very, very interesting. And we have to understand the implications of those decisions. Now, you heard about Jody took a, all my steam about the rates, and so did Bill, and I'm happy to report it does look like we're going to be flat out for the next five to six to seven years. And that's an effort, obviously, that includes a, a little bit of God's help with the water, but also our focus in the organization at driving costs out and avoiding costs wherever possible. Our continuous process improvement program has saved or avoided roughly $90 million in costs in the last five years. And we look at everything, no matter how big, no matter how small. And that's part and parcel of the culture that we're driving at WAPA. Now, some of you may have seen a big announcement yesterday. If not, uh, I will bring it up again, and that is, Given WAPA's footprint, we've been looking at how do we manage our energy imbalance services across the various constituencies that we serve. On Friday, we announced that our Sierra Nevada region in California, which takes the Central Valley projects, is going to be joining the energy imbalance market sponsored by the California Independent System Operator. It just made sense for us. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this energy imbalance concept, it's basically the last 5% in the last five minutes of the hour when we need to balance the balancing authority, we will go out to the market to buy the extra power that we need, or in the case of having excess, we will push it back out. It is not a full market like you live here in the Upper Great Plains with SPP. And it, so it allows us to really manage better on the fringe. If we don't do energy imbalance, we have to go out on the market and buy more capacity. And that gets very, very expensive these days. And in fact, for a couple of our regions, the Loveland area projects and the Colorado River storage projects, without an energy imbalance service, we're going to have to procure somewhere between 30 and 40 megawatts of capacity. And again, that's expensive in this marketplace. So we made the decision for California last Friday, and yesterday we announced that our Loveland area projects, as well as our Colorado River storage projects, as well as a small section of the Upper Great Plains West, will be joining the SPP Energy Imbalance Service, along with Basin Electric and Tri-State. Now you may see some things in the trade press about this because some of our other nearby neighbors, in particular a couple of unnamed investor-owned utilities, don't like our choice, uh, but the, hard, the reality for us is one size doesn't fit all. That's why we can look at the California Independent System Operator for our California system and certainly look at the Energy Imbalance Service from SPP and make a decision to do both. The one area that's left out right now is our Desert Southwest region, and they're going to undergo with us and all the customers, we're going to be doing a study to understand which direction do we go in. Now part of this is really important because we can't ignore what's happening in the future. We can't ignore what's happening today. And what's happening today is the closure of coal plants. What's happening today is that on our 10,000 megawatt nameplate system, we have 2,800 megawatts of renewable. There's 5,300 megawatts or so of renewables in our queue. Now, while that won't all get built, that's changing the dynamics of how we physically operate the system. So we've really got to be prepared. We can't just stumble in and hope that something is going to happen for us. And therefore, our decisions around the energy imbalance 
uh, services um, is going to take us better and out into the future. Two other sort of quasi-technical items that I wanted to mention, similar to our decision in terms of looking at the energy imbalance market and the energy imbalance service, the closure of peak, which was the Western Grids uh, reliability coordinator, they're going out of business in December. It means fundamentally we don't have an RC, as we call it. So we've made the decision for part of our system to go into California with the California Independent System Operators Reliability Coordinator area, and on the eastern side, so to speak, of our system to go with SPP for Reliability Coordinator Services. And some folks say, well, gee, how can you do that? Again, keep in mind we're 15 states, 1.4 million square miles, 12 different river systems operating very differently. So we're be, we are transitioning to two different RCs at the same time. It's sort of a little bit of a juggling act, but it's, um, I think it's going to be very successful. Another piece that's important for us, again, not so much in Upper Great Plains, but in the rest of our system, we're joining the Northwest Power Pool Reserve Sharing Agreement. And folks, when you look at this, um, it, is, it feels like it's lots of different pieces because it is. One size doesn't fit all in how we're operating. Another piece I wanted to mention very briefly to you, we've been working on what is known as a common SCADA vendor project. Today, the Western Area Power Administration operates three different supervisory control and data acquisition systems, one of which is old and homegrown, two of which conflict with each other, and I can't move staff from one to the other. Now, we're not going to a single system, but we're going to a single vendor in this process. And I think that's important, again, as we try to drive additional cost out, be more flexible for our operations. Great to hear the work you're doing, Tom, and the team on cybersecurity. This is what should be keeping us all up at night. I can tell you, at getting somewhere over 200,000 hits on our firewall every day, uh, it, it is an amazing activity to follow up, as we talked about at dinner. How do you manage in this world where everything is at risk? The iPhones we're carrying uh, today were hacked uh, about two weeks ago. Again, constant need to fix these things. We're also working on physical security, which is truly my nightmare scenario. As you can imagine, going across 15 states, 17,305 miles of line, 322 substations, 488 comp sites, and 177,000 structures, we have a pretty big footprint, one that is out there, one that is visible, one that is a challenge for us. Now, we've implemented a number of improvements to our physical security program to enhance efficiency and cost effectiveness. We went from about 1,000 remediation activities down to 450. We've gone through every one of our substations and now we're starting back again. And I think most important to me are two things. About 84% of the plant's physical security remediation activities are going to be complete by the end of this month. And I'm proud of the team for doing that. And in 2020, we're taking the outside assessment teams and we're going to have WAPA employees looking at the physical security instead of spending money on contractors. We think that that's a much better way to go. And of course, this coming November, many of us will be participating in NERC's uh, uh, GRIDX. I want to wrap up and be conscious of time and maybe answer a question or two, Tom, if that's okay. Um, a couple of things, cyber threat I mentioned, uh, the convergence of operating technologies and information technologies, but also a little update on Washington, D.C., our favorite place to go. Right, Paul? Um, a couple of things have gone on. One is that we've been looking at what is the future of fiber for us? And over the past uh, six or seven months, we've had six, I believe, meetings with customers about what is the future of fiber. And there's three pieces to keep in mind. At WAPA, we've got roughly 50% of our system is fiber connected right now, and I need 100%. And that's for utility communications. And that's kind of a no-brainer. But the other two components are really important to understand, and that is a number of our customers <laughs> Other utilities, co-ops, munis, even down to uh, some jails, would like to figure out can they get access to our fiber network? Because they're in rural communities with no access to high-speed broadband. 
So the question has been raised repeatedly, GWAPA, can we hook into the fiber that we're paying for? And right now, the answer is, I don't know. Right? We're not sure one way or the other's legal issues, there's technical issues. So our internal team working with stakeholders has been looking at that option. In fact, we had a meeting last week uh, back in, in Lakewood. The third piece, which is really important, there's something called the American Broadband Initiative. And that was going to be a uh, executive order out of the White House mandating that all federal organizations turn their fiber over to commercial providers. That sent a uh, chill up my spine, um, both because of security reasons, but also the, our business model. And we were able last year to get a delay of about a year and a half for us to study the fiber market. That report is due in December. If you go on to WAPA.gov under the source, you can see all the material. So we're looking at the technical aspects, the cost aspects, the legal aspects to develop a report that we're to deliver to the Department of Energy in December, and that they are to deliver that to the White House. I want to make sure we protect your assets and all of our fiber assets. And remember, there's two components here. We have customers who desperately need to get the broadband access and as well as we need to protect that fiber for our own utility communications. So I think that's really important. If you've got more questions, I'm happy to, to answer those. The second piece is the integrated resource plans. There's some language that exists which requires all of you, as you I'm sure happy to do, to provide WAPA with your integrated resource plans. We are working to get that re requirement removed. We believe fundamentally between markets and your state requirements, it's a duplicative effort for WAPA to require you to do an IRP for WAPA. It just doesn't make sense in this day and age. More on that to follow. That's floating around D.C. right now. And certainly last on the DOE front, uh, we work really hard to keep good relations with the Department of Energy. Uh, I think that's just kind of my nature, but also it has proven very positive for us. This past year alone, we've received nearly $3.5 million in funding, equipment, and licenses that are non-reimbursable, which means you don't pay for them. And this has helped us on our cyber side, it's helped us on our physical security side, it's helped us on our accounting side, our Microsoft licenses. So having good relations with the Department of Energy has paid off not just in uh, stress on me, but also in real dollars and cents. We're able to get technologies that are normally only available to certain three-letter agencies and get them deployed on the WAPA system at no cost to you. So from my perspective, that's, that's a great win for all of us. So I do want to leave a minute or two for questions, but I, I want to go back to what I said early on about our core values. This is something that folks in the organization really have taken to heart. And as one of the tribal members from the Hualapai tribe told me during my river trip, the fact that we talk about seeking, sharing, and partnering was the thing that she took away the most from the nine-day river trip. The thing that I took away most was I was happy it was over. <laughs> so, so thanks. I'm happy to answer a question or two if we've, if we've yeah, got time. Yeah. You can't all be that shy. Or... Well, why don't you address the DTA? article. Oh. Just, just so, so, so Tom asked, uh, yesterday there was a very unflattering article about the Bonneville Power uh, Administration uh, that appeared in the media, and so Tom asked me about that. Um, our friends at Bonneville, and they are clearly our friends and, and sister organization, have a different financial structure, fortunately, than we do. They also face some real environmental costs and challenges. And the article, which I think was very slanted, I don't know why Bill and Tom both read it, uh, really uh, talked about BPA being bankrupt and how the hydropower wasn't valuable on the market. And my response is, I think the hydropower continues to be valuable. I think the market movement that we've seen here in the Upper Great Plains, the dollars that have benefited by being an SPP, kind of disprove the fact that hydropower doesn't have a value. Certainly, BPA has got its challenges, and we'll continue to have them. Uh, but I'm glad we have our structure. Thank you, Mark. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Appreciate it.